Hello and welcome to Inside Intercom. I'm Liam Geraghty. Last year, Intercom, Klaus and Support Driven partnered to publish the first ever support quality benchmark report with the goal of uncovering what good results in customer service actually looks like. In the 2022 Customer Service Quality Benchmark Report, our objective was to look deeper than individual metrics. Instead, we wanted to view trends in the industry. The findings from this year's report allow us to tell an even bigger story of the direction the benchmark metrics are heading. Joining me today on the show to discuss the report and how support quality impacts businesses are Macrina Sheridan, Director of Global Frontline Support at Aircall, Martin Koiva, Founder and CEO of Klaus, and Declan Ivory, VP of Customer Support here at Intercom. There's three main topics taken from the report that we're going to get into today. The first one will be going over the actual support quality benchmarks and discussing what trends our panelists have seen on these benchmarks. And then we'll talk about proactive support and self-service solutions and how these two fit in when talking about support quality and growth. So let's get into our first topic, which is the support quality benchmarks taken directly from the report. To give more context to these figures, we've sent a survey out to hundreds of support professionals in the software and internet industry, consumer services industry, financial industries, and many more, with company size ranging from 10 employees to 10,000 plus. We're going to focus on three data points out of the six mentioned in the report, CSAT, IQS, and FRT. Let's start by looking at CSAT, which is the metric that measures how well a company meets their users' expectations. It's calculated by survey with a question to the effect of how satisfied are you with the company's services? In the report, we learn that the average CSAT of the teams interviewed has increased by 11%, from 78% to 89% this year. I want to bring in our panelists here and ask you if this is a trend that you saw reflected with your customers, CSAT as well. And if so, I'd be curious to hear if you have any insights into why you think the average CSAT is on the rise. Martin, I might start with you. The, the big big trend that is underlying a lot of this is the the, the move towards commoditization of certain products and services. So the really high customer satisfaction, like the great customer service becomes a competitive differentiator. And that's happening in so many different areas. So I think that the focus is moving to customer satisfaction, to excellent service, because frankly, sometimes there isn't much else to compete on. Because if everything else is pretty similar in some industries, then that's where the the competition actually happens. And Declan, what have you seen with Intercom customers? Well, in in general, our customers uh, have always thankfully given us very high CSAT ratings and we've obviously seen that maintained. But if we look at the industry trend, which is very interesting that CSAT has increased. And for me, if you look back over the last couple of years, I think organizations that have both survived and thrived through the the, uh, changes that we had to make in how we delivered business across the globe uh, as a result of the pandemic, really that's helped organizations accelerate their digital transformation. And in doing so, I think they've really had to look critically at support as a differentiator, as Martin has said, and that they really had to think about the digital customer experience as they've made that shift to digitization their business. And in doing so, I think that has naturally driven up uh, CSAT. I think using technology in a different way to provide support looking at it as a value add as opposed to a cost center, it really means we can differentiate support. And that is coming through, I think, in in the trend we're seeing in the survey. Moving on to another benchmark, IQS, or internal quality score. I want to start by defining it, as not everybody listening in might be familiar with it. IQS is a metric used to measure how well your support team performs against internal standards. It's based on each support team's individual scorecards. So the standard will be different for each company. Only 39% of companies report tracking IQS. But for the ones that do, the average IQS went up from 81 to 89%. So Martin, I know Klaus is somewhat of an expert when it comes to IQS. So I'd like to start with you again. Could you share some of the benefits of tracking IQS and what are the steps required to tracking it? Yeah, sure. I mean, quite simply put, IQS is the same thing as CSAT, but looked at from the inside. So if CSAT is 
customer saying how the company did in the interaction, then IQS is the company assessing how they did in that interaction. So it's the internal scoring, basically. So if we're all one team, then somebody from another team might assess our work and say, okay, like here they followed procedures. It did very well with this or the other thing or not. And the reason why you want to do that is because if you only track customer feedback, then it's a lot like asking the, the patient for feedback on the doctor's performance. Now, of course, that's important, but they are also not in a position to assess uh, the, the medical prowess of a doctor. So so that's kind of why you need to do these internal reviews as well. So, And it's very similar to you know, code review in engineering or like the editing process in writing or coaching in sales. Macrina, what are your thoughts on this? As similarly, we use IQS in a unique way, particularly at Aircall. My general philosophy when it comes to hiring for my support teams is to be using support as an incubator for growing people's careers internally. And I think support agents often make really incredible hires for their team, given the knowledge that they have of the product and some of the skills they develop in the role. And I think where IQS can be valuable in that context is that it really does help us develop a more holistic view of an agent's strengths, the opportunities for growth, better than metrics alone. I think metrics can support a narrative, but I think they all have to kind of work together. They're like different organs in a body, and they all support a more holistic view of the players that we have within our team and how we can use them effectively in the organization. Yeah. Now, one thing I would add to that is that it's not only about this, frankly, you're like made up metric. It's like the metric is supposed to describe uh, something at scale, but ultimately it is about you systematically reviewing or like trying to gain insight into the work that is happening. Because keep in mind that if you already have one single layer in between you and the front line, then you already don't know. Like unless you have this dedicated process of reviewing and giving feedback, then you don't know what is actually being said in those conversations, what is actually happening. So it's also about, as Macrina also already was uh, saying, it's it's about gaining this awareness of how are people doing and what is actually being said. So it's not just that number, which frankly you know, alone doesn't help you as much. The last benchmark I want to dive into is FRT, first response time. First response time is pretty straightforward. It's the time between a customer initiating a ticket and the support rep's first response. The average varies a lot depending on industries, with some industries relying heavily on automation to have an FRT of just a few seconds and other industries having FRTs longer than 24 hours. So to everyone, really, do you make it a priority at your companies to offer quick response to customer tickets? And if so, could you share what your FRT is and how you got to that? Yeah, no, interesting. Like first response is sometimes a very emotive thing. And for me, it all centers around understanding the customer expectations and also to some extent setting the customer expectations around when you will engage with them and respond to them. And there are definitely issues that customers have that, you know, based on the combination of the customer impact and urgency, absolutely demands and requires an immediate response. And as a support organization, we, you know, we should be there for the customer for those particular issues. And there are situations where it may not need an immediate engagement for the customer. And the customer is okay to wait for when the person with the right skill or expertise is available to actually resolve the problem in the most effective way possible. Sometimes it's also about responding when it's convenient for the customer. You know, so I'm trying to drive the concept of, you know, scheduling a chat back or call back is actually okay if that's what suits the customer and actually makes most sense to get the maximum engagement with the customer around whatever issue or problem that they have. And also, if we look at the customer experience, FRT is important because you build up trust when you engage with the customer. They know that you're you're taking ownership for the issue. But ultimately, it's about the time to resolve the issue and also the quality with which you are in terms of how you resolve the problem as well. So FRT is absolutely important, but I think it's around responding at the pace that makes sense for that customer and for the issue at, at the point in time. So it's not necessarily about the fastest response always. Yeah, sure. I think there's like three factors that go into it. First of all, like what can you afford? 
because if you need to take i don't know engineers away from their work to drive down the frt then uh, maybe that's not the best idea so it's like what can you actually afford to have as the frt because for sure i think most companies could have frt in seconds if they put all their resources towards it but that doesn't make sense in most cases then there's a question of like what is your competition doing so if you look horrible in comparison then you probably you know, need to work on your frt and then it's what declan was also saying it's about like what actually makes sense in the context so there are certain areas where you need phone support because if like a food courier is standing outside somewhere then they need to immediately get through Versus if you're selling something that isn't super urgent, then having an FRT of 24 hours might be perfectly fine. So those are the things that I would consider. But as a rule, in my experience, better FRT is always, it's, it's pretty good. It helps you with CSET. It helps with mostly uh, everything. So I want to move on to the second part of the show today, which is how to maintain quality through growth. And I chose this as a second topic to cover because an astonishing 48% of support professionals interviewed felt that it was their biggest pain point. As a company is scaling up, it acquires more and more customers, meaning more and more requests for customer support. If you're not prepared for that growth, it can quickly become overwhelming to try and manage the increased pressure on your support team without making adjustments to your support strategy. So back to our panelists who have all been part of fast growth companies or joined a company from early days and scaled the support team up. How did you and your team manage increased support queries without losing the quality of your support? Yeah, it's it's pretty simple in our case. So so my previous job where like the real experience comes from is uh, I was the global head of customer support at a software company called Pipedrive. And the answer there was we basically reduced the number of channels we were operating in. Like we had loads of problems. We had all the problems in the early days. But then one of the biggest epiphanies was that like we don't actually need to be everywhere at the same time. So we reduced the number of channels and we focused on the ones that we thought that made sense at the time. And that also changed over time. And we just became better in, in every way. Like quality went up, answer speed went up, and it was just trying to do fewer things, but better, essentially. Yeah, I mean, it's a really interesting space. Like, How do you scale your organization and maintain quality? Uh, again, for me, there are a number of factors, but one of the most critical is actually maintaining your bar when it comes to hiring. Like, so you're going to hire in the right people at, at the end of the day. And even if you're scaling fast and growing fast, you've got to make sure that you maintain the quality of your hiring. You don't compromise your bars. That, that, that's the first point. And the next point is you obviously got to onboard agents or specialists in a way that you're setting them up for success. You've got to really make sure that they understand and know the product areas that they're expected to provide support on and that they understand your processes internally, particularly around you know, how do you deliver a quality experience to the customer. So again, as you scale out, it's important that you make the right investments in, in onboarding. You know, particularly if your organization is getting more complex as it scales as well, you've got to make that critical investment in onboarding. That's key to maintaining the, the, the quality down the line. And then also it's, it's around delivering a level of autonomy to the team, particularly to newer members of the team. Yes, you know, you, you expect them to, you know, to take ownership for issues that they work on on behalf of customers, but you also make sure that, you know, there's a, there's a safety net there. There are more tenured agents and engineers available to them, and you provide them the authority to go and engage with other people and get the support that they need. And that kind of collaborative environment is really, really critical as you scale as well, if you're going to maintain quality and make sure that everyone, you know, is, as I say, is being set up for success. That's the first part, which is kind of the human support part. Then the other part of kind of scaling is really looking at the work inflow that you have and are there ways of reducing the number of contacts that you're getting, whether that's through automation or better self-service technologies. So it's really through focusing on the combination of the two that you can really scale a support organization and deliver high quality support and a great customer experience. 
As a follow-up question to this, how big of a factor do you think onboarding and running frequent quality assurance reviews were in maintaining support quality through growth? Yeah, um, I would agree with Declan that even if there is a an, a need or an urgency to hire quickly, never to hire under duress, mm. even if you are. And I think that kind of goes hand in hand with training as well. When you're bringing new people on board, there's a probably an urge to put people in the ticket queue or in a chat queue or a phone queue quickly. But if you're not setting them up for success, if they don't feel like they have the resources or the tools to be able to support clients, you're not only going to hurt them because it's very hard to get out of the support queue once you're in it, but you're also hurting their teammates and the clients as well. And so I think giving new hires the space to ramp up fully, to feel confident that they have the support system that they need or that they have a good foundation of product knowledge and process knowledge is really valuable in the long run and is worth making sure that people have the time to train with, you know, if it might take a few extra weeks, giving them the space that they need. Yeah, I 100% agree with both of those thoughts and I had the same experience as well. And like that, if, if you do those things, then... You will also get benefit for the company, which Macrina was talking about before, that people join support and then they go on to do other great things in the company if they're set up for success. And I actually, uh, I don't know if that was the case for you as well, but we had the opposite problem that people were moving out of support so quickly because they were so capable that we had to put a rule in place that you need to stay for a year and then you can move on because otherwise we would have been... We've had to do the same. (laughs) Mm. Is it also one year? Such a problem hiring such talented people. Yeah, that's the best problem to have, right? Automation was mentioned there while we were talking about maintaining support quality through growth. Um, So I'd like to talk about this more in detail. Could you tell us more about what automation tools you use internally, uh, why you've put them in place, and what's the impact that they've had since you put them in place? Uh, have you heard of Intercom or Aircall? Those are, those are great. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even joking because uh, we, we do use both. And I think we have uh, Guides, I think is the name of the, the feature, right? In Intercom that uh, really helps us onboard customers quickly. Like we, we use a lot of the stuff that is built into Intercom and Aircall. And I don't really have like a great comparison because we have been using them from the very early days. So I don't know how bad it would have been without those various automation features. And like we have like all those proactive pop-ups and whatnot, but it's fully built in into our product from the start. Well, as, as Martin mentioned, Intercom is a great platform where there is kind of automation built in. So I'm pretty lucky I can use the Intercom platform to provide support. So, for example, we use bots quite extensively as an example to triage conversations as they come in to try and get more customer context, you know, make sure that we have as much information as possible before you know, a, a human is ever involved in the process. Uh, we also use the resolution bot to actually try and resolve problems up front you know, through a totally automated fashion. So just as an example, like last week alone, we triaged over 1,700 conversations, you know, and we probably saved anywhere from 5 to 10% of our headcount purely be able to triage up front and automate that whole process. So again, in terms of enabling scale and making sure that we don't have to linearly add people as we scale the business, I think the use of automation and bot technology has been critical to that. You know, automation is just one facet of it, an overall self-service strategy as well. You know, so we like to kind of drive our community, which is interconnected. We like to drive you know, other proactive support initiatives as well, product tours, et cetera, onboarding information. Make sure that we're proactively providing as much information, which again, just helps us in terms of a scaling challenge and you know, maintaining quality. We really focus our, our people on the right issues for our customers. Yeah, we're currently reevaluating some of the tools and systems that we have in place at Aircall. But one of the things that we're considering, actually two of the big things we're considering, are the ability to scale with our company's continued growth and transparency internally as well. I think it's very important. As the organization grows, those two things become absolutely crucial to continue to make sure that we have smooth transitions for, like we spoke about, our new hires and our existing teams, not only on support, but as they're joining maybe from other client-facing teams internally to make sure that there's context and access where people might need it. 
When we ran the same survey last year, we found that 85% of support professionals interviewed said they were using proactive support to reduce repetitive tasks. In this year's report, 70% of support professionals said they plan to invest more in proactive support in 2022. What that means to me is that proactive support is not a switch that you flip on and off. Even if you use it, there's always ways to add to it and improve it. So back to our panelists, I want to ask you to share how you've used proactive support in your companies, or if the use case is more interesting, have you seen your customers use proactive support? I think it's becoming kind of the, the holy grail because many of the really like pioneering companies are hitting very high CSET numbers and eventually you will you will be at a point where you need to ask like, okay, like what else can we do? Because like clearly like 95 or a hundred percent sees that doesn't mean that like everything is perfect. You can always do more and proactive support or basically getting ahead of the problem before it gets reported. That's kind of the next like frontier. So lots of talk about it recently among our customers and most of our customers are big usually quite advanced support organizations. And there's any number of ways you can do it. Like on a very basic level, what you can do is try to look for, let's say you have a software product, try to look for customers that are potentially hit with a bug and reach out to them proactively and say, hey, we noticed this, try to kind of engage with the customer before they do. And like as for, as for different tools, so many different uh, ways that you can go about it. No, like single thing that you should be doing. It's it's more about the the concept of trying to get a, ahead of the problems before they get reported to. Because if you think about yourself as well and how you interact with products and services, you don't even bother going to customer support many of most of the time even. So that's kind of what it seems to be about, and definitely on the rise as the. The rise in the average CSAT, I think, also indicates. So if the sort of average is going up, it means more companies are also thinking about like, okay, how can we do even more? Yeah, I mean, price support is pretty fundamental from our point of view. I think people are aware, in time, we have this kind of philosophy of the funnel where it's proactive support, self-service, human support. Uh, and it means that we do try and look at the customer journey from the time they you know, first commit to, to the product you know, to then using the product. So we do have a lot of focus on the onboarding side of things and how can we proactively set the customer up for success. That means we collaborate cross-functionally, for example, with our academy organization who do a lot of the training for our, our customers. So we, we see the information proactively with our customers from the kind of whole onboarding phase. We also look at high volume conversations. And if we see that as a particular topic that is generating a lot of conversations, we will then proactively go out to customers on this topic and, and, and make them aware. So an example is managing holidays for example with, with intercom is, is a high interest topic so you know we will then when holiday periods are coming up whether that's thanksgiving in the us or whether it's christmas new year in the rest of the world we will practically go out and make markets available to our customers and how did they manage scheduling through that you know we then also have what we like call reactive proactive support so if there's an issue with the platform we're making sure that we're going at the customers and, and advising them proactively around what's happening as opposed to having them have to go to the status page etc so there's lots of things that you can do proactively but it is a journey i think as you were saying liam and, and as martin also said there's layers and, and i think you have to iterate all the time and improve the level of proactivity that you provide to your customers so it's not a it's not a one and done type situation it's a constant learning and understanding how you can add more value proactively for your customers. Yeah, one of the things we're really thinking through at Aircall is where we meet the client in their journey and in, in the client journey and, and their life cycle with our product. So where can we educate them on the product and usage of the product to make sure that they feel like they have the tools available to them. They might not know that they don't know how to use a certain piece of the platform, but can we make sure that we are pushing the education terms and resources to them so that they can access it where they need it and, you know, predicting their moves before they're able to know what those things are. I think it's really interesting what Martin said about proactively engaging and notifying clients communication about around bugs that are known in the platform. That's a very interesting concept to me. But right now, I think what we're mostly focused on is education. And I think when we're talking about sharing bugs out, that is 
probably something very valuable, particularly when we're talking about business critical tools. What impact did you see it have on your support since you put it into place? Yeah, not, not, not the most interesting answer because it has always been in place in our case. So, so we can't really tell, but, you know, based on our very high CSET and just the, the general perceived happiness of customers, it seems to play a key part, but it's because it's always been like integral. Like at Klaus, I can't really tell apart like what the sort of specific impact has been. And, the, you know, it goes for different types of functions that we have at Klaus as well, because for the longest time we, we had a single combined role that was customer facing. So that included proactive support and onboarding and all those things. And that, that's kind of the philosophy that we have is that as much as possible, you should try to make it like a seamless experience or the concept of the customer effort score, right? And that's kind of what it's related to as well. It should be effortless and seamless for the customer. And one of the ways that you can do it is if you kind of infuse the proactive support and you make those connections internally like between support sales and success as seamless as possible so from the customer's perspective every just everything just kind of flows and you are contacted proactively at the right time you and you don't hopefully even need to reach out with too many questions because you got great onboarding the right messages at the right time and so on lots of similarity you know just one thing that from our perspective has worked really well is particularly focusing on the onboarding phase and trying to be very proactive through that, you bring the, or you reduce the time it takes for the customer to actually get value out of the investment they've made in Intercom. So you're really making sure they're, they're getting return on that investment far more quickly through the whole proactive approach. And the other thing that we've benefited from, which is kind of related to the second topic we had around scaling, you know, in, in being very proactive with our customers, we're actually reducing kind of case and conversation interaction with us as well. So it's helping us scale better as well. There are two kind of quite tangible impacts that we've had from a more proactive approach on support. Proactive support is often used to reduce the workload of your support team, and so is self-serve support. Could you all share some details about the self-service initiatives that you put in place and how you couple them with proactive support and automation to offer quick and easy support without putting pressure on your teams? Yeah, a good question. I think I kind of alluded to to earlier, like the, the whole self service strategy or approach is kind of multifaceted, and proactive support is, is kind of one aspect of it. And the other thing is having a very vibrant and strong community. So in our case, it's we call it the interconnected community, and it's where customers to some extent are supporting each other, and you know customers are getting issues resolved, you know, even without ever having to engage from a support point of view, and that. You know, it's part of a self-service strategy. And then there's strong knowledge management. So, you know, within our help center component within Intercom, we try to provide as much help and assistance, both in terms of the some technical aspects of the product, but also, you know, how they use it, set up, configured, et cetera. And having that information available and displaying it in context in terms of where the customer is, in terms of, of, of how they're using the product, that is absolutely fundamental to, to a self-service strategy as well. Um, and it ultimately drives a better customer experience. Like some people look at self-service, well, it's a way of reducing costs or being more efficient. It actually delivers a much better customer experience at the end of the day, you know, because most customers want to self-serve. Like that's the, the reality of the situation. If you can provide that capability to them, they will embrace it, they will use it, and they will have a better customer experience on the back of it. To elaborate on what Techline was saying, I think it's a balancing act though. There are many companies out there that view self-service as as kind of a way of just doing away with customer service altogether. So that there is a way of like doing it the wrong way, I think, which is for the for the customer to feel like there's just no way of getting through to this company. Like there's there's no way of like getting to human support. So I think the good way is to make the experience such where the customer feels like I can get through to them. It's just that I also have this, all these other options. And there's a reason why you're not given help desk articles when you are trying to reach out to the emergency services, right? Like how to resuscitate a human being. Like, have you read this article? So like, you need to be able to get through as well. Like, that's how you feel like, okay, I'm not alone in this, but maybe, you know, it actually isn't like that big of an emergency and maybe I will go read that article. So I would say that it's difficult to go wrong with it as well. 
But in our case, there's a lot of video involved in the self-service as well, because we have a software product. Screenshots used to be like in all the articles, but we've heavily moved towards video as well to use in self-service. That has become so easy in the past few years. Like the tools for doing like various formats of video have become so available. So I, I think that has actually saved us and our customers a lot of a headache over the past few years. I want to ask one last question before we wrap up. Is there one trend that you see playing a key role in the customer sports space in 2022 and ahead? And what trends will your teams focus on? Yeah, happy to take that. One thing that we're looking at at Aircall is making sure that support and account level information for our clients is all living in one place. So the experience that that's giving to the customer is that they feel like everyone who is familiar with their relationship with Aircall has a holistic view of issues they might have been experiencing, the tools that they use, when they reached out, and making sure that our internal teams have full transparency into their entire existing relationship. And I think one of the dangers for teams as they grow, which is I think sometimes inevitable, is to get ahead of the silos that might quickly exist and to make sure that those barriers are broken down. That ultimately does benefit the client, but it also helps us move more quickly in our growth. And it helps us respond to clients more quickly and effectively and be able to predict where they might need help, where they might need support. and it kind of all goes back to the conversation of where can we predict where our clients might need us and get ahead of it before they need to reach out. Yeah, I think for me, the most impactful trend at the moment is, you know, the focus that many organizations are putting on using technology in a smarter way when it comes to support. And in particular, I think one manifestation of that is the use of AI, ML technology uh, within the whole support experience. You know, an example using NLP models to kind of look at customer sentiments real time, be able to use as a trigger to when you might need to escalate a, a case or when you might need to intervene in the case in, in a different way. And that's just one example. I think the, the opportunity to apply AI ML within the support space is almost boundless. And that for me, I think, is one of the, you know, the most exciting trends because the technology is maturing in a way where you can actually apply it now in a very real sense and have a huge impact in terms of the customer experience. Obviously, what we do is related to like this uh, introspection and insights and like reviewing the conversations that have already happened. And now after uh, being involved in this for four years, actually, it's uh, now getting to a place where there are many companies tracking IQS and getting pretty good at it. And that the new level that they are now on is asking how can we connect the dots between like what we are seeing here and then what is happening elsewhere in terms of quality related performance for the agents and coaching so like how do we make sure that like what we learn here gets translated into good CSET and then in between something actually needs to happen which is the broader coaching and training as opposed to just like very transactional like you said this wrong here or this was a good reading in this email like there needs to be some kind of broader training and that, that all those things usually happen but what we see is that customers are now trying to consolidate that into like one big process so it makes sense so they are trying to put the CSAT and IQS data together, together with training data. And we have also released features for all those things in the past past year. So everybody's getting more strategic about improving the quality, not just like doing one thing here and then another thing there that isn't connected. So, so that's kind of the, the big trend that we're definitely seeing. That's all the time we have today, but I'd like to thank our panelists, Macrina, Declan and Martin for all their insight. If you'd like to learn more about the Customer Support Quality Benchmark Report, you'll find a link to it in the show notes and the blog post for this episode on intercom.com forward slash blog. That's it for today. Thanks for listening. Listener.